Hi, everyone. I'm Carol Stern, Chief Impact Officer at Lion Tree. Last week, we released our annual Outlook podcast where we discussed what to expect across all different sectors like music, sports, and European TMT. And this week, we'd like to shift the conversation towards vision. What is our vision beyond the balance sheet? And how can we integrate purpose within our business? At Lion Tree, we believe that understanding the intersection of business and purpose is crucial in shaping a future where success is measured not just in numbers, but in positive impact and fulfillment. This prerogative is not just for business leaders and executives, but for all of us. To that end, I am thrilled to be joined by Lion Tree leaders Avi Sutton, Rosie Kermaniak, Aviva Rumani, and Rachel Kraus to discuss our vision for the firm in 2024 and beyond. First up, Lion Tree Managing Director Rosie Kermaniak discussing how we're merging profit and purpose in Lion Tree's advisory business. I want to start by like talking about how the world the world's changed. You know, are you finding that your conversations with clients changed this past year? You know, beyond just a need for capital, are you finding that the needs of the businesses are vastly different? What they're asking for from you is vastly different? When you come to the firm, or at least when I came to the firm, one of the first books that REA recommended to me was a book by Jeffrey West called Scale. And uh, part of it is premised around the growth cycle of businesses, irrespective of this particular time period, sort of going back to any time, any period in time or any period in history. Um, and the statistical fact is that most businesses last around 10 years. They have a life cycle of around 10 years. And the only way to sort of out alpha or outgrow uh, your 10 year life cycle is to grow faster than what we think of inflation or any you know financial metric. So that's easier to do in the beginning of a business's um, cycle because you're small and the numbers are small. So you start from zero, your growth rates are very high. But as you get later and later in your own investment cycle, growth slows down, not only because the numbers are bigger, but you're a bigger company, you sort of lose in innovation, you lose your edge a little bit, um, and you need to reinvent yourself. So I think of things as we are in a very unique moment in time. Um, from two perspectives. One is we've been through the internet cycle, which is, you know, it was a 10 year cycle or an eight year cycle and it started in the early 2000s. We've been through sort of the app cycle where it was a hardware cycle and we went through a new thing in our hands and all of the connectivity and creativity and the apps and everything that went into the phone became its own, you know, 10 year cycle. And now, of course, we're sort of entering into a new AI cycle, which we have zero idea what that is, what it will be, but it is going to be a new cycle and it'll probably be a faster cycle than anyone, any of us can contemplate. And then you just juxtapose that with the fact that every company in and of itself is trying to reinvent itself and have growth in one of these very remarkable periods where we have a challenging regulatory environment, we're at the end of a capital cycle, and companies are trying to reinvent themselves out of, um, you know, this sort of last cycle, which is a little bit of a mix of direct to consumer, social media, connectivity, scaled connectivity, et cetera. And it feels like we may be going into a little bit of a productivity mode as opposed to a direct consumer, look at eyeballs, you know, big flashing lights kind of business cycles. So I think of it as we're just trying to help people in different ways, which is to try to bring people from like a late stage. We've we're in many mature industries that in, in many respects are with great businesses that can reinvent themselves. They knew, they do need to reinvent themselves through revenue growth, not so much with cost cuts and just simply capital for capital's sake, but using the capital to you know, take some of the late stage businesses and transition them into new stage businesses that may be with productivity, it may be with partnerships, it may be with you know, direct to consumer offerings. But that's how I think of it is we're trying to guide companies towards acceleration into a new cycle. So in your year on letter, you talked about interconnectedness. When you think about those cycles, like you think about the pandemic and you think about social media and you think about technology, how has that changed the nature of how we approach each other? Like what's the interconnectedness for all of us? And how do we deal with like this technology growth, the AI growth, as well as that true human connection? We use two, two words interchangeably that actually aren't. There's a difference between connection and connectivity. 
And we pulled the connectivity lever very far, you know, we pulled it all the way down and very appealing and it made us feel global. And we got the sense that we were connected because we had connectivity, the sense that you could talk to somebody in, in a different country or in a different geography or a different uh, grouping, social grouping than your own was really appealing to us. And it felt like connectivity for a long time. And the fact that during the pan pandemic, we would otherwise have been locked in our own houses and we could talk to each other. It felt like it was connection. But now it sort of feels like coming out of it, it feels a little bit less so. Right. And that's what my partner and I, Jake, were trying to highlight in our letter a little bit. It just feels like maybe that's been saturated for the moment. I've just finished the book, uh, 48 Laws of Power, which is like a long time coming. I'd never read it. But um, one of the things uh, that Robert Greene said is sometimes leaders in times of acceleration of, of innovation sort of um, put themselves in a place to remind people of nostalgia, you know, because it is a little bit comforting um, to sort of hear that there's a stability, right? <laughs> a warm place. A warm place, right. Yeah. Um, and similarly, in times where, where there's a little bit slower growth or maturation, that's when you want to accelerate into newness and innovation. And that's like a leadership tool. Of course, we're all trying to go towards technology development. So it says nothing about technology development, more just how do you talk to people, relate to people, interact with people. And that's a little bit of what we are trying to bring out is it just feels like the right time to go back to connection as opposed to connectivity, because we're missing a little bit of the one-on-one -on -one touch and feel in front of each other types of interactions, not only in business, but you kind of see that highlighted in the thematic of live experiences in media and entertainment right now, going to concerts, being with a big group of people, but feeling the energy of the humanness Human of people common. is really what people were craving. And so it just felt like the right time to remind people just literally be in someone else's presence at the moment. But building on what you just said, I, you know, I think also the, the whole kind of relationship based. Wouldn't you say that's a value for, for Lion Tree? I, absolutely. And there's a little bit of uh, Lion Tree that is both, right? Um, the fact you could never be authentic. You could never provide advice to somebody en masse, right? It's always one-on-one -on -one and in the particular. And we're always trying to solve a solution or a problem or a concern. And you can't really get to it if you're not in a in a space, a safe space, so to speak, you know, <laughs> but the whole purpose is to have that with many people over a long period of time and also to connect that to people who are either having similar problems or have solutions for the problems and to have an awareness of the entire eco ecosystem so that it, it fits together well. So I think of Lion Tree as a little bit of both connectivity and connection, sometimes together, sometimes separate, sometimes with groups of people, sometimes one on one, et cetera. But I think there is a magic and we don't want to lose either of them. Just in the context of that conversation, if you dial it too far in one direction or the other, then you lose the synergy between the two. And I would agree with you. I mean, I think that's part of the magic that does does happen here is that synergy. Okay, so between today's like really challenging geopolitical environment and the current macro environment, how are you approaching M&A differently in 2024? I also throw in regulatory to that environment and probably a whole list of seven other things that we have been talking with our clients about. When I grew up, it was the start of the uh, a consolidation phase. And so I also think of the environment as the people who are operating in the environment as well. Um, a lot of us grew up by merging our way out of things, you know? <laughs> so put two companies together, it's supposed to result in a in a synergy, which could be a revenue synergy, it could be a cost synergy, it could be a people synergy, it could be a platform synergy, it could be a growth synergy. Um, and it feels like regulatory or otherwise that, you know, that's not a path that's available to us right now, but we're still going back to that first principle that we talked about, which is it's all about revenue growth. So you have to think about M&A as putting it together in a different way. 
And sometimes you work with large companies who are looking to go grow revenues by, you know, looking at smaller companies who are building out entirely new, you know, growth profiles. Sometimes you're thinking of it as just a partnership. Like I have all of these capabilities, but I'm missing this one capability. The capability, by the way, might be capital and the capability might be an ad tech platform or data or uh, a, an interface with the customer or whatever it may be. So we're trying to think of it less as how do we out merge this cycle and how do we like outgrow this cycle by thinking about how we can create strategic alliances, strategic partnerships, and sort of filling in gaps either with smaller assets that complete the portfolio or just capabilities. And hopefully over time that leads to m a because people have relationships with each other they we are the they path. know each other yeah. they're familiar with each other and uh it may be not a 2024 kind of you know m a boom but it would lead to an upswing of m a over time so it as part of that, like, how do you manage communicating through the conflicts, though, when you bring those partners together? So I think about this on my personal level and how I manage through conflict with the relationships that I have. And then I port that out into what is that? What could that mean? How do you approach these larger scale discussions? And Jake and I, in our letter, highlighted uh, the Sam Altman conf conflict and the Disney Charter conflict and all so what we saw as sort of these headline driving conflicts of 2023. I always think of conflicts in my mind as I feel better when they're done, right? <laughs> There's always Put something. <laughs> I know. But I look back on some big conflict that I had with somebody and say, I was really glad I had that conversation. Like, I was really glad I had that conversation because one, that person meant a lot to me. It meant a lot to me to have that person sit across from me and kind of work through something that was really difficult. But ultimately, what you're trying to do is say, like, this situation, it either doesn't work for me or it doesn't work for you or it doesn't work for us both. And we all believe, or maybe there was some point in time in history that we sought out to do something and that something is still here and resonant for us all, right? <laughs> So I think of conflict as like not let's like let's point into each other and tell everybody what we've done wrong and what we've done um, terribly. And, you know, it's not a social media thing where we can just sit there with our thumbs and sort of jab at each other, you know, and that's in many respects, that's what feels bad about social media and the connectivity that we talked about. And what feels good is when you're sitting in a room together with somebody and you remind them of what's really important to you and you can do it in a way that's very tactful and respectful of somebody else's considerations, somebody else's life, business plan, you know, whatever it is to say that. And when I go into conversations, I say, it's n really not about what happened, what you did, what I did, what you said, what I said, what matters is like what we're trying to get to, which is over here. And it feels like we kind of drifted in this direction. So how do we get over here? And I always feel like that's a respect for a relationship, a respect to sort of sit down and want to do that. And also like a regrounding towards like where we this thing that we pointed out, like we we love that. We want to go there. We want to get to that spot. So it's always feels positive. It feels positive to say like, OK, let's let's try to get closer to that. And it just feels positive to like sit in that personal space to be authentic, to be connected, to be human and to sort of walk through it. That's not always easy to do in a boardroom or in a business setting. You know, I'm trying to extrapolate it from my own personal life to, you know, something in the, in the external world and why we highlight it as part of our letter. But, you know, the principle is always there, which is we're trying to get something that is in a place that's reinvented for either you or I or all of us and the actions that we take to get there. Sometimes our reactions, sometimes they're protective of our own businesses or the way we need to do things. But if we each say to each other, it's important for us to meet in the end, we'll never not meet in the end. Well, and I think that's almost like what we teach children when we teach them conflict resolution. You know, we teach them to always start by vesting the relationship. You know, you don't bother to resolve a conflict with someone who doesn't matter to you. So that's the relationship, you know, and then the other is to approach a difference with curiosity, not animosity. So help me to understand why you believe this is right, as opposed to you're wrong, I'm right. So right. interesting. And in many respects, it just it doesn't matter because in the end, what we decided was we wanted a friendship or a 
business alignment or an improvement in, in growth or something. something so right. Then we have a common goal. Exactly. So let me switch gears a little bit. So speak to the importance of IPs in today's market. It's the center of everything. <laughs> it feels like, like I have my own IP, you have your own IP, and every company has its own IP. And we've always just thought about IP as movies. It started that way, you know, like that was the sort of penultimate was to have something on a big screen that every everybody went to, right? Social media developed a different kind of IP, which is sort of a personal IP, if you will. And then you saw an ecosystem of advertising, an ecosystem of growth, an ecosystem of viewership in a different generation sort of build itself around personal IP. And you saw people either start to monetize themselves as a brand or monetize brand inside of their own personal space. But it was, in many respects, an, an extension of if you were to see Tide inside of a movie, that is a way to sort of monetize advertising or product placement or whatever the case may be inside of content, right? And IP in and of itself can be extended into what people are now talking about as a flywheel, which is you can take something that is a cartoon or a character and make it a theme park, make it a t-shirt, make it a sneaker, make it a commercial make it a movie, make it anything you want to. So the base IP I think of as always um, something that can be, you know, the source of creation of things that Starts other people can monetize um, in unique and creative ways. And we're starting to see that. Um, innovation at the big media companies, you know, continuing to do that, but also in smaller, you know, regional companies where you're doing a museum of you know, Van Gogh paintings or whatever the case may be, where you can start to create and take IP as a, you know, a piece of art, but turn it into an experience or a product or a placement or anything like that. And that in and of itself can sort of grow the market for, at its core, creativity. I want to get your perspective on AI. You know, you and your writing partner, Jake Donovan, you included in the section of our year-end letter you wrote, how will the anticipated tidal wave of efficiency impact each industry and society overall and create scale, velocity, and progress without the impact of the technology becoming inhuman? So it's a big question, but I would love to hear your view on how we balance humanity and technology during the AI revolution. I started uh, as a banker in the late 90s, and I remember people that were senior to me were referencing doing investment banking on, on the little ticker tapes that all their models were with pencils and, you know, written down accretion dilution was always with an eraser, you know? <laughs> and then, you know, the people that were, that was sort of maybe two generation, two generations above me and the generation above that sort of, you know, laughed, but in the same sense, also lovingly sort of brought up the nostalgia of Lotus Notes, right? <laughs> and Excel as the replacement for Lotus Notes, right? So to me, I try to simplify this and it, it it's too hopeful of a thing because you can go well beyond AI as a replacement for humans, but I sort of try to think of it as just the evolution of the productivity tool. So there's going to be some format of Excel that's going to do something more for us than every generation that had in the past. And it will be something in part that I will never understand, but generations below me will snicker assume, at me right. <laughs> and assume and keep going with. And, you know, the hope is it's just technology innovation that saves costs, that can generate profitability, that can do all the things that we've talked about, innovate, reinvent, reinvent grow, et cetera. It's always all intermixed with the sort of the ris risk that it replaces humans and humanities. I kind of choose not to think about that because it's not literally staring at me. The thing that sort of catches me is it feels like it's going to happen faster, that all these cycles seem to have happened like we had an internet boom and it felt like a 10-year cycle. And going back to the earlier question, we had an iPhone boom, right? We're we're obsessed with a we're obsessed with what's in our hands. But it did feel like that was a ten year cycle. It just to me, I was talking to a CEO uh, late last week who said this is going to be far more impactful than people think it is. And what I think is going to be really surprising is like to our monkey brains that it's going to happen far faster than we're able to comprehend. So it's going to feel like it's a Bigger, bigger contributor lead. yeah, and therefore less human. I don't even know the, the ways in which it's going to become inhuman and overtake us. Like I 
personally just kind of block that out <laughs> and we'll see what happens in five years. And um, that's not to say, like, don't take part in it or don't participate in it or to in any way sort of put it in the closet. Like, it's not going anywhere. It is going to be here. But it just try not to think about the existential risk and try to really think about how it can help us be much more productive. And if you listen to Sam Altman and you listen to, you know, people who talk about it from a people standpoint, to solve some of the hardest problems that humans can't is actually one of the greatest gifts that it could give us, right? To solve cancer, to help us live longer, to help us live healthier. Like you have to kind of balance that with the, I don't know, the extinction concept. <laughs> <laughs> Love the conversation. This has been really fun. So I'm going to wrap up with the last question, which is basically to have you define the essence of Lion Tree and how you anticipate that we're going to navigate all of these complex topics in the coming year. I triangulate this with three separate concepts. Um, one, personally, I don't know why, but in the last three to six months, I've been struggling with exclusion groups. Exclusion. It's been in my brain, either for myself or other people. Who is... We were in a conversation with REA a couple of weeks ago where we were asking him what it's like to go between here in Israel or here in different parts of the countries because people are so disparate and different things are going on at different times. And he sort of used this concept of borderless, right, <laughs> which at the time it was perfectly logical that it was geographic, you know, that there shouldn't be an Israel and a U.S. There should just be humans. Like I took it in that way at the time. Um, and sort of three is sort of this concept of going back to connectivity and connection of like who's in and who's out of what group, you know, <laughs> um, and the thinking that Arya has always said to the people of Lion Tree that everyone is here for a reason. All these things, um, I've put them together in my own mind to sort of answer this question. And I work, by the way, on the financial advisory side, so I'm a tra traditional banker. And sort of the question is like, if you had a banker and the banker was X to you, when you didn't need X, you would look for another banker, right? But the essence of Lion Tree is supposed to be that concept of sort of borderless when you need one thing someone from Lion Tree can step forward, but when you didn't need another thing, someone else can step forward and someone else can step forward. And so it's not about creating heroes. It's not about creating like a small contained ecosystem of the people that are in or out. It's really about having a group of personalities where it's not really clear what everyone's individual contributions are. And that allows for you to change personally over time, but also for you to grow with your clients and for you to step in and step out of things depending on who has a need and when. And that to me is how we should be talking to each other and talking to our clients and thinking about the business model of Lion Tree as evolving, changing, yeah. listening to clients, having certain people step forward, certain people step back, certain groups of people step forward, depending on what is needed in, in the moment for the greatest need of the people. So I uh, we wrote this as our last sentence to our, to our essay, which is as follows. There is never and there is and never will be a replacement for the warmth, compassion, integrity, honest thoughtfulness, quiet confidence, advocacy, friendship, conviction, and steady hand of a longstanding, trusted, or even potentially new partner to engage you in any conversation that reinvents you, your relationships, your company, your industry, and ultimately your worlds. We wrote that is Lion Tree, and that's how I think of it. Rosie, thank you so much. Up next, Lion Tree's Chief Operating Officer and General Counsel, Avi Sutt. I want to start by asking you about flow. You know, how do you define flow? Then tell me how you achieve it. First of all, happy to be here, Carol. Uh, my first podcast. So really excited uh, to have this conversation with you. We obviously spent a lot of time at the end of last year, Alex and I, uh, putting some thoughts on paper. Um, and the topic that we came up with was essentially flow. So flow in its simplistic definition is probably a steady stream, right? The way I think easiest to explain it or to start to explain it is it's probably the opposite of friction, right? And so on a basic level, someone who flows can be viewed as someone who is in sync with other people, uh, adaptable. Um, but that's really the initial building blocks. The way we think about flow 
uh, and explained flow in our letter is how companies, organizations, sports teams, to use our kind of example there, and ultimately kind of countries can support themselves to support a broader positive purpose. And uh, we think those building blocks, how to achieve it, are very much um, based on having a foundational set of principles. These are your values. This is what you stand for. And being very fixed in those, but being nimble and adaptable in how you execute those, right? The world's in an ongoing, evolving place. Uh, industries uh, continue to evolve. People continue to evolve. But if you're fixed in your principles and your values and what you are stand for, and you're able to quickly adapt to execute on those, uh, we think that's how you can achieve flow. And to use the lion tree analogy, the roots, the branches, right? Those are your principles. Those are your core. Those are your foundation. Sometimes those are like unseen. Uh, and then the branches are kind of the flow where you could go north, south, west, east, and kind of impacting throughout, but it's all part of the central, central unit. I don't think of flow as this one-way faucet stream, I would say. Uh, I think flow as we think about it is two-way. And uh, two-way can be two people, me and you can quote flow, but it's more so how do organizations, the collective, really flow uh, together. I think to just extend that to the lion tree, um, you could have a deal team that flows, right? They're working together, they're in sync, they get each other, um, they love and trust each other. We could, we could talk to that uh, in a bit. And then you have uh, them being in flow with other deal teams or within other functions or business products. And so you could have the New York office flow, but that's not where we stop, right? Then it needs to flow to our London office, Paris, San Francisco. And then you have a global organization that's internally flowing, but we don't stop there. We then need the internal external flow. And I think that's how we uh, view Lion Tree's success and how we differentiate ourselves is when you have this internal flow uh, in an organization, in a community, um, and you're all in sync rowing in that same direction to the North Star, um, you are then best positioned to assist your external community and the internal external flow as we as we talk to it here, I think is what what we view as making Lion Tree a very special place. So, you know, it's interesting. When I when I think about flow though, sometimes it happens kind of organically. Like you talk about the tree. So the rain happens, it takes it in, there's flow and, and nutrient. I think in an organization, flow happens with intention. I think that's right. You can have people who may have that common set of values or principles or characteristics that lend themselves to flow with others. Uh, more easily maybe than others, right? Once you have that common set of principles, it may lend itself to uh, people then flowing together more naturally. But I think to your point, um, flow just doesn't happen because you turn on the switch. Um, you can meet someone and you guys can click, you'll be in sync. But for purposes of an organization, the organization is way beyond its component parts. So while on a component level, people can flow one-on-one, -on -one, an organization to flow requires um, ongoing work in terms of the people who are brought in, in terms of constantly uh, ensuring everyone's kind of uh, working towards that same North Star um, so that there is this flow. Because uh, we talked about in the letter, I mean, and we, we, you know, we said in the Bible, but in the sense of uh, in times of war and times of fear, right, when people are almost inclined to gravitate to themselves or to protect their own, um, that brings out typically the worst in people in, in many ways. Um, when people feel secure in their uh, relationships, in their environment, in terms of rowing in the same direction, there is that increased likelihood of, of flow. You know, you used the words earlier, love and trust. Yeah. So do you think that those exist as singularities or do they exist cohesively? When we were thinking about flow and how to define it, um, we kept coming back to two concepts, love and trust. And so love plus trust equals flow was our ultimate title. Love and trust certainly can exist in the singular form, right? The example we use is you can, you know, love your kid, but you wouldn't trust, you know, your teenager maybe to drive. Uh, you could uh, trust your president to do good, but you may not love him or her, right? Um, and so these are principles that I think everybody has in their personal and professional life all the time. Uh, when you bring love and trust together as the foundational principle blocks, you can achieve flow. And I think what we're saying is without love and trust, you're not going to get to flow. I can trust you for your professional experience, for your ability to achieve whatever the task is. I know that you can get it done right, right? It's almost saying like I have a high level of confidence that you can achieve whatever it is at hand, that I don't need to think about it, worry about it, or question your opinions or, or kind of that you're acting selflessly. I think about that similar like an athlete, you know, I don't have to like the first baseman, but boy, I'm going to throw him the ball if it's going to get the guy out. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. And so on a team, 
when you're working on a deal team or as part of a broader organization, knowing that person's got it is very, very important. But it's not just for achieving the task. It's more so uh, as you talk about initiatives, as you talk, talk about the organization, as you talk about strategic decisions, what, you know, what else should we be thinking about big picture? Having that trust and not having to question that, you know, people are essentially uh, acting selflessly towards the end game as a collective is is critical. And love is is no less important in many ways. And I don't, you know, we don't need to define love, you know, in kind of the broadest sense of the term maybe, but love in the sense of you care for the other. Um, there's this sense of warmth. There's this sense of understanding the person for who they are and sympathizing with them. You then, I think, bring that together it's it's a way of saying, you know, I'm invested in this person and together we're, we are one. While we have our component parts, together we are one and we're much greater than the individual component parts. You know, I know that you recently um, had another child and I wonder how being a dad, like what, what do you take from that that comes into the office? In my prior life, I was a corporate lawyer uh, at Wachtell Lipton and you do deals for a living. It's M&A and it's round the clock. And it's uh, intense, high-pressured situations with, you know, a lot on the line in terms of bet the company type transactions. I used to give the analogy of people kind of think they're in an emergency room delivering kids. And having been in that situation, I think what I realized post-first kid or what kind of colleagues told me, I would say within a few months of having my first kid was, you're so much more understanding than other people. You never really seem to get stressed out when, you know, there's these tight deadlines. I don't know if everybody said kind, but almost of the sort of like, you're so, you are so nice. And it's not to say that others don't do all those things, but I think the environment uh, almost allows people to kind of, in the day to day, get caught up in the stresses, um, in reacting. I think having children gives a lot of perspective, at least in my experience, about life, meaning uh, the world. Um, it's uh, a selfless exercise in many ways, probably when it's done right in that uh, you're constantly thinking about the other as one does for their spouse and, and others in their life. Uh, but now this is kind of a piece totally of you, other, right? Is right? <laughs> a piece of you and you're responsible for, you know, them living, breathing, eating, succeeding. And that's what you think about every day and every night. And so I think it, it for me, was a very helpful moment to stop and learn to think about the other and think about, wait, what is this person uh, thinking about right now? They mean well, they're good inten intentions. Um, and I, I think some times people get caught up missing, missing that it's just a, it's a new lens and you could do that as an attorney because you're trained to think about the other side and their counterpart and how they're going to think about something. And, but you're really using that to negotiate and achieve the best outcome for yourself. Whereas when you really kind of shift your lens to thinking about the other empathizing with them, um, I think you engender, and, and I know it because the teams I used to work with, you know, there and here feel it and uh, they then reciprocate. And you're kind of getting at, okay, that has created some sense of flow by virtue of these principles of your relationship um, that allow for it because it doesn't happen without intent. So let me bring you back to the office, you know, um, yeah. how would you define Lion Tree's mission and, and vision for the upcoming year? Lion Tree's mission has uh, probably always been consistent, which is we are about our relationships and it's how can we help our relationships? How can we help our community? And of course, you know, we're a company and we have various business products. And so um, as we speak to our, our relationships, uh, speak to our clients, there's various ways we can help with our business products, you know, on independent advice, whether it be M&A or capital markets or potentially investing. It's really how are we partnering with our relationships to help them solve their problems? And sometimes it's on a personal human level Sometimes it's on a professional company-wide level. Sometimes it's helping industries. And I think big picture, it can be helping countries and, and helping the world, I think. Um, as I think about uh, Lion Tree, um, one can look at the first 10 years of Lion Tree and say, this is what Lion Tree did. And this is what it stood for. These are the, its achievements. I think when we look to the next 10 years, uh, limiting ourselves to what we've done is certainly not the case, right? I will say having worked with you know, our founder led clients, our organization, you know, ambitions can and should be endless. Um, and I think we as a company view ourselves and view the world more and more so as being borderless. So, you know, why stop uh, in a certain geography? Why stop with a certain business product? Why stop with a certain industry? I think we look at ourselves and say, 
the world is becoming more and more borderless by you know virtue of technology and, and the world we live in, we will continue to evolve uh, with our uh, our relationships, our clients as they continue to grow on the outside by virtue of kind of having our internal flow optimization. We look to help uh, more and more those relationships as they continue to grow and continue to I think have that impact on the on the broader world. And I think as we uh, are in I would say complicated times, maybe is the word I, I think about. There's a greater and greater desire for more unity, more flow, more togetherness. And I think we um, have served as that uh, community for our friends on, on the outside, outside these walls. And I think we just will continue to grow and grow what that community represents uh, over the next decade. So kind of last question, but it's digging a little deeper on something you just said. What do you see as, as our, our firm in particular, but firms in general, you know, responsibility for unity and flow beyond the purpose of their business, but purpose of society. That has certainly become a critical topic uh, that I think a lot of companies are grappling with. And to me, many uh, of these situations seem to be very reactive. So it's almost like society has raised this need or people have started to kind of wake up and say like, wait a second, why are we just focusing on our little bitty thing or our business. I think Line Tree is the reverse of that. So we've been way ahead of that in that our foundational principles have always been, how can we help? I remember a month in, uh, my first in very interesting experience with Arye uh, was he was on a phone call and he hung up and I was very surprised by virtue of what he said on that phone call. And he said, we help people and we do good things for our friends and our clients. Good things will happen for Line Tree as a result of that. And I think that's a really special special way to think about it because we're not backing into some desire to like do good or to think about the world or to go beyond, you know, it's the four corners of your office. Us, right. it's, this is what we are about. We're about helping people. We're about helping the world. And we've created this business to help our parties. Sometimes they want the, uh, just independent advice and sometimes uh, they need, you know, an M&A transaction. And sometimes they just want help in advising, you know, an industry or a country or whatever it is. And I think uh, each of us here has that dual responsibility from day one, which is you've got to do your role, right? Which whatever that role is in the organization, you've got to do your role for the collective quilt of Lion Tree. But you can't isolate that from our role, our Lion Tree, to the broader community and to the world. And that's why we emphasize internal, external, and flow. Because when it's all done right, you've got a very special world, I think, that, that you are now a, a really uh, nice part of. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Last but surely not least, I'm thrilled to welcome Lion Tree's Chief Corporate Development Officer, Aviva Romani, alongside my dear friend, colleague, and co-podcaster, Rachel Krauss. I wanted to start with a question which was near and dear to my heart. You know, let me, and I'm going to start with you, Aviva. Your, your life, you know, really changed this year. You had your first child, so mazel tov again. And, you know, how has motherhood impacted you? The decision to become a mom was a huge one. Um, I've always wanted to be a mom. Um, I've seen so many amazing women that I work with, um, you know, it, it, within the walls of Lion Tree, but also, you know, in terms of our relationships and our clients who, you know, seemingly do it so well and so effortlessly and, and smoothly. I think for me, the biggest thing was just the, the sort of notion of time has completely changed. For many years, um, you know, professionally uh, and especially in a sort of a client service ecosystem, you always put the client first um, and work first and uh, that changes. Um, and I think it also gives me an appreciation of of other people's time and prioritization as well. So when I'm now speaking, you know, to a client and instead of, you know, before I was like, oh, do you want to catch up on Sunday morning? It's like understanding those boundaries that, that people have in a way that is is extremely uh, real. You know, so for me, I think it's a big exercise, frankly, that I'm still undertaking of just how to organize your time effectively, how to delegate, um, you know, some of the, the work that I uh, have historically done for the firm, we now have built an amazing team of people that can frankly take on some of that and enable me to, you know, elevate and prioritize. You know, the same goes with how, you know, I treat my group of clients and just making sure those calls are efficient with, you know, KPIs and delivering on what we say. You know, that's a big hallmark of, of what we do. And I think, you know, motherhood makes you realize time is precious, time goes by quickly. 
um, and it's your most valuable resource. You know, it's really interesting. I know that having had really big jobs for at least the major parts of my children's life, people would always say, so how do you do it? And I would always say some days better than others. You know, it's like if their socks match, it's a good day. You know, uh, Rachel, yeah. you know, you you have four children. <laughs> we have four children. Socks are never matching. <laughs> never. <laughs> Ever. So it's very interesting watching kind of the evolution also of held uh, various roles during different stages of, of our children. Um, and we now have a 15-year-old, 13-year-old, 11-year-old, and 7-year-old. So each in kind of very various points of, of their lives where it um, it requires different parts of me. Uh, to in terms of in terms of the dynamics, in terms of ch challenges that they're facing, in terms of values that we want to imbue in, into our home. I think for me, one of the greatest realizations and transformations with with raising children and in, in this world and and kind of alongside um, kind of a professional career was how to take your values and things that are core identity, like what is really core belief, core purpose, core essence and deal with personalities and all sorts of tricks of the trade that don't necessarily align with this perfect structure that we've built or conceived of for each of them or for, for our household. So how do we take what's core and then scaffold kind of the right set of qualities and ideals and structures that can help each of them become their best selves in their unique way while still having what we believe is kind of a core underpinning of those values. So for, for us, we, we're architects now, <laughs> not just parents, PhDs in architecture, um, to see how how is it that we can keep that bedrock sound and safe and trusting and root them and plant them in ways that we can also scaffold their each individual um, identity and characteristics and qualities. I love that imagery. And I, and I think about that even in terms of work, you know, like where's the safety net, where's the scaffolding, and then where do the values that hold up all of that stand? And it leads me right to why we're together. You know, the two of you wrote what I thought was the most magnificent letter. I really did. It was personal and it was heartwarming and, and it was profound, all three. So, um, and it was, for those who have not yet read it, it's called The Harmony of Dissonance. Expand on the title a little bit. Tell me how you got to it. What does it mean for both of you? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, um, the period where we were writing these these letters, and I encourage everybody, you know, we, our colleagues um, and REA wrote, you know, some very personal sort of messages, but also ones that my hope is resonate with our business community. Um, you know, it, it's been a really difficult year for many, many people. Um, and, you know, in, in our letter, we focused a lot on the conversations that have been um, pushed to the forefront of whether that's what's happening on college campuses, whether that's what's happening politically, whether that's what's happening, you know, frankly, within the walls of companies that are in transition, you know, both on a leadership level and with your own, you know, group of employees. I think there's still a lot of weight um, and stress in the system that's coming out of, you know, in a post-COVID environment. But then, you know, October 7th happened, um, which, you know, really has been playing out on a on a global stage. Um, and I think, you know, the, the what's become clear is, frankly, not enough conversations are happening. Um, I think there have been conversations that have taken place very much within an echo chamber where the 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 reach and the intention of building bridges has not occurred. And I also think, um, you know, for for how we go through this year, which obviously here in the U.S., we have an election cycle that's very polarizing. Um, you know, the the need to have the, that active dialogue does not mean in any way you need to agree. But having that dialogue, and, and I had, I was talking to a, a client actually recently who is on the board of um, a relatively small, very prestigious private university. And the way um, she uh, described how the campus leadership um, dealt with post-October 7th was fascinating and actually quite simple which was really gathering the heads of all of the different student groups and effectively, even in an extremely emotionally charged time, getting everyone in a room in, in um, 
what I, I and I'm not a huge fan of this term, but in what truly represented a safe space, because I think that term has been really stretched um, in in other ways. Um, but as as gathered people in a safe space to really talk about what it meant for them personally, for their you know religion, for their belief system, um, and and it really helped um, dissipate a lot of the hatred. Um, that I think you're seeing in other campuses, other communities, certainly online and social media. And I think the students appreciated that. So that that to me really struck a chord at the time. You know, it's it's interesting that you that you went to the campuses because there was an analogy that was given to me at a meeting of college presidents that I thought was so perfect for what we're trying to do at Lion Tree even. They they talked about the campus being a potluck dinner. And that if somebody is um, coming to the potluck dinner who's a vegan and you, the host calls you and tells you, you might or you might not make a vegan dish, but you would label your dish. Yeah. You'd make sure everybody was comfortable. And if you got the call that somebody was coming that had an allergy to nuts, you'd probably be less likely to put nuts in anything because you wouldn't want, God forbid, it happen. But you would really make sure people were aware to create that safe space. But the host wouldn't have to call you to say don't put poison in the food. They could assume you know that. And that what we're seeing is maybe what we assume people know is not what they know. It's an interesting, what does the dissonance mean for you, harmony with dissonance? So it's a great question. I think harmony, we often think about as as working synergistically and beautifully. When you think about harmony in music, like these are sounds that meld and mesh beautifully together. And even building off of the music analogy, dissonance creates friction and tension between chords, but also allows for that music to be fluid and and flow magnificently one note into another. So playing off the dissonance, there's actually so much opportunity. And I think that in, in that notion of like, whether it's dissonance or friction or tension, that can catalyze extraordinary creativity and allow for holistic thinking and for solution finding that may not always be there if things are if things are structurally harmonious. So I think dissonance is actually a form and it's a texture that actually creates an underlying opportunity to create new harmonies where there may not have been before. Absolutely, and I think it speaks to your echo chamber comment. If we're only talking to the people who agree with us, we never move the agenda forward. We just build higher walls between those that we agree with and those that we don't. There was one quote in the um, in the letter that I'm going to read. You wrote, at Lion Tree, we are privileged to operate in what investor Jeremy Giffen calls the perfect business, the perfect business, a classic merchant bank. We are valued for our advice, our insights, our experience, and our ability to connect people in a borderless world. Speak to the work that we do at Lion Chi and how it serves to connect people in a purposeful way. The the firm was was always founded really on this premise of being a classic merchant bank, which you know matches both a, an advisory business um, and also an asset management business or or an investing business. Right? It's something that we've grown um, very organically, frankly, as we. We have for the rest of the business um, a very p- sort of purposeful build. Um, we've not, you know, expanded by the hundreds like you know some of our our peer group, and we've done that for a reason because um, we've deeply value the bespoke nature of our relationships. It also speaks to, frankly, how we're structured inside. A lot of you know the larger banks, for example, um, banking teams are very siloed. Nobody talks to one another. At Line Tree, it's completely the opposite. There is a lot of dialogue between our banking team, our leadership team, our operations team, our strategy team, our purpose, tr- you know, team, and our asset management function really sits at, at the the inside of that. And we have the ability to really match, uh, you know, best in class capital relationships with best in class ideas. And sometimes, you know, that. Um, those those ideas can really, you know, help lead to relationships that last the sort of life cycle of a company. So we have, you know, our venture fund that is much more early stage. You know, we've tracked a lot of those CEOs for, you know, the past decade plus. Um, and, you know, sometimes people move on to to different roles and, and what have you. But that's really, I think, core to what we do. And we try to offer for our clients really um, true 
uh, unique insights and and real advice without the agenda of just sort of transactions and notches on a board. Sure, that's nice, and we do run a business, so it's it's important. But I think you know when you speak to a lot of our community, that is a core tenant of the firm that you know differentiates us. Frankly, it also alleviates some of the pressure in the room when you're having these discussions with CEOs. It's it's again, as I said, not a transaction-based dynamic all the time. It's much more relationship-based. You know, with that dialogue and that building of relationships over time, it builds trust as well. Definitely. There is a definitive, like, lion tree community. I think people, people feel, feel like they're, they're part of it, you know. know. You reference borderless. So, Rich, what do you mean by borderless? How do you think about that? So often when we think about borders between businesses, between functions of in industry between countries, uh, sometimes that creates a limited scope of thinking because we box in certain preconceived notions or box box things in based on those based on those boundaries or borders. And I think one of the core values that's rooted in trust. It really it really comes down to that because I always say you trust is what sets the speed limit. So you only, can only move at the speed of trust, which I think allows for certain uh, space for speed and creativity um, and what. Aria calls scaled intimacy, which is how to take that trust and expand it um, and deploy it in meaningful, thoughtful ways. There's a certain limitation that borders create. So in, in, on one hand, it does create structure and does create a set of guidelines and principles. And sometimes those there are limiting factors of of board of boundaries and borders. And I think the way that that Lion Tree in its all of its relationships and in its conduct, both inside and outside, think about things that are above and beyond. Like what does it look like? when you start to think outside of those limitations. And that, I think, fosters a sense of trust and creativity, collaboration, camaraderie, uh, and some of those uh, those pieces that break traditional ways of thinking. So let's let's stay with that for a minute. Let's step outside the borders. Okay, when you think about Lion Tree, where do you see opportunities for unity and togetherness? I think it all goes back to our ability to bring people from disparate backgrounds, whether that's from different companies, different sectors, uh, countries, together, um, kind of unified around dialogue, um, unified around certain thematics. We host a lot. It's sort of a core tenant of, of the firm, whether it's, you know, really small, intimate gatherings, you know, here at our office, brainstorming sessions. I mean, I remember, you know, in the early, early days of the firm, we would, you know, when we had just one office before we expanded, you know, bringing people together, um, not even hearing our own insights, really giving giving the sort of table and the platform to clients and the CEOs that, um, you know, have really forged, you know, interesting and creative paths and companies, you know, give them a, a platform to, to speak and to bring people together to help enhance that dialogue. And that takes trust. You mentioned trust, Rachel. You know, um, how does trust play out? What's the importance of it in the workplace? So both for inside and outside, trust is the is the feeding ground for all. It, it, it's, it's very hard to progress in any way without having that sense of of knowing that on a very kind of basic level that somebody has your back or somebody's looking out for your best interest, that it's not self-motivated, but that there's a larger collective essence and collective purpose around some things. And I think that that has been mechanized and and structured in a way that gives gives a, a core sense for all participants, whether that's stakeholders, whether that's employees, whether that's partners, whether that's clients, a sense of kind of the ground rules. And I think that um, that again, trust is kind of the cornerstone base of of all of it. You're not in it just for yourself, that there's a sense of higher, kind of a higher order. Does that take intention or do you think that just happens? I think it takes intention. I think there are, you need almost certain pillars that uh, that input that intention and others might might draw from that just by being in the system. So not everybody has to have the intention for it, but the intention has to be there for it to exist and for it to exist in perpetuity. So it needs to be something that's constantly fed and reinforced and calibrated and recalibrated. Um, and that those that are in that are in and can feed off of it, I think it does it, it enhances the whole. But I, I definitely think there's a an importance of it setting that intention. You also wrote extensively about the pit. The internal work that we need to do to to get us out of the pit. Tell me a little bit more about the pit as you see it. Every day, if I'm feeling frustrated, um, like I'm not sort of, things aren't going smoothly, which happens in our business and in any business all the time. I sort of ask myself, 
are you in the pit right now? Like, are you just, are you feeling that, that um, emotion, that frustration, frankly, that feeling pissed off? Is that, is that escalating? Which I think, you know, we all can agree that doesn't make you productive. So, you know, being in the pit, you know, um, for me personally, also last, last fall and still working through it is obviously, you know, some of the events that have, have transpired and frank and seeing that kind of global hatred, if you will, in that, um, emotionally charged environment and, and, and just seeing stuff on social media and, and what's out there in the world and what's happening on campuses, um, as really scary. And, you know, you asked me about motherhood earlier, you know, my son is, is only nine months old, so he's got a ways to go before, um, you know, kind of being out there in the world. But you do think about it, I think, when you're a parent at any age, can you set your kids up for success in, in a very complicated world? I grew up in a time where, um, you know, my first cell phone was a flip phone. Um, and I remember when, when I had a phone that actually could take pictures and what, what that started to mean. It's a, it's a very different world. Um, and I think falling in the pit is is very easy um, for all people. Um, so it's sort of become a little bit of like a mantra reminder for me as I, you know, um, pursue my my goals professionally to kind of remember to to stay in that sort of grounded place and also to like see the other side of the coin um, with the people that you're um, engaging with, even if it's not you know necessarily a on a issue or a dilemma or, or situation um, where you're all, you know, constantly in agreement. You know, even this morning we were on a call as a team, um, you know, really debating how to handle a, a pretty delicate sort of client situation. These conversations can be, you know, charged with people's own opinions and expertise, um, but just, you know, elevating your mind um, to actually seek, you know, the, the truth, the right answer. Um, and frankly, you may not even be right all the time but to have um, also confidence uh, in your decision-making to go forward and to constantly move forward. There are ways to self-identify things that are that inhibit us, and whether that's fear, whether that's vulnerability, insecurity, and often we look for shortcuts to self-soothe and to make those things feel better and to kind of look for the hand to help us out. And there are moments where we've got to climb out ourselves. You have to figure out where to find your footing, where to put your arms, kind of, you know, invest in your upper body strength, lower body strength, mind, body, soul, all at the same time, and then to pull ourselves out. And that involves an extraordinary amount of self-awareness, intellectual honesty, kind of moral reflection, um, and in intrapersonal skill. And that often just gets overlooked because we're in a speed game and we want Band-Aids to fix bleed outs. That's, that doesn't work. So um, so I think that that notion of being in a pit is meant to be a self-inducing reflective space to say that you, you've got to look inside to see what is it that's truly holding you back? Why didn't that work? What was the real core reason why that didn't work? And when that when that inner work is done, it allows us to be able to you know, calibrate those fine muscles and, soft, and often the neglected muscles that can give us the capacity to grow back up and then grow forward. So it's kind of a balance, though, of living in the moment and looking forward. How do you balance that? I often think about, you know, on the pit uh, analogy, mm -hmm. a metaphor. If you think about a ladder, you can't only look up. You have to look to see, you have to make sure that your feet, that that your footing is rooted in, you know, just to make sure. So that there is this notion of looking up while stabilizing the the, the aspects. I think that that is, that is the, the the contrast, but also the, the symbiotic partnership of future and present. So to understand exactly where you're standing, to know that, and at the same time, know that you're climbing towards something else. So it kind of that, you know, building off of that analogy. It speaks also, I think, to why the firm is called Lion Tree. We like to say we're really grounded kind of in our roots, which is, you know, as a company, right, your core values, obviously individuals and building a team with, you know, complementary skill sets and in investment banking, right, that's, you know, idea, you know, generation, relationship management, uh, best in class execution, you know, those are sort of the roots, right? That's that's expected, right? That's sort of the bare minimum um, of excellence in in doing um, what we, you know, say we want to do, and then, you know, complement that with with the sort of the the leaves, the branches, and that's sort of you know much more 
far reaching, that's growing our ecosystem, both in terms of relationships, sector coverage, unlocking opportunity between, you know, two people or two companies that don't necessarily have a relationship. I think, you know, we're seeing our reach expand to other regions, which we touch on also in the letter. As I hear you, it, it is a matter of while our leaves are extending, our branches are growing, we continue to feed the roots, though. We continue to strengthen the roots. That is what sets us apart. So it's not about scale. It's about strength. It's about ensuring the relationships we've created are sustained and that the significance of them is held on to. So let me wrap us up with a last question. Um, we started with motherhood, so you can't give me that as your answer. But <laughs> what gives you hope? What gives me hope, and I'll speak uh, prof you know, on a, on a company level and with a professional lens, I think over the last year, seeing um, our community really come together, seeing, you know, CEOs at all stages and life cycles of themselves as as leaders. It has been a rocky year um, for the market in general, certainly for the sort of media and technology ecosystem. Um, a lot of high highs and a lot of low lows. But what gives me hope is is I, I do feel like there's been an interesting kind of reset moment that's still ongoing, a bit of like return to core um, in the best way. And, you know, to the degree that Lion Tree, you know, facilitates that dialogue and, and just as a place where people and these, these CEOs feel like they can come to us for advice or just bouncing ideas off, mm -hmm. off of us, these conversations, um, is something that I think brings a lot of joy and we get the opportunity to see that, you know, every, every day. Even just surveying what the world is today and what it is right now, where there's so much chaos and turmoil and destructive behavior. And at the same time, there's also an unbelievable, uplifting, unifying expression also. And I think if we take our cues from history, you know, there's nothing is new. These are repeated patterns, repeated themes that have happened since the beginning of time. And I think that I, I believe in people. There are, especially like in, certainly in a, in a firm like this and surrounded by thought leaders and kind of creators and thinking about how to make the world better. How do you take purpose? And, and not just, it's not just something we do, but it's something we are. And how do you express that and build around that? When we look around and we're surrounded by, there's, there is good, there is good in the world. And, and I think that uh, there's a real sense of, of hope and opportunity and possibility. And where things are dark, it means that we have the capacity to create light. And where things are light, you have the capacity to expand that light. So that, that gives me hope. The harmony of dissonance. Thank you both so much, really. It was such a pleasure to talk to both of you. Thank, Thank you, you so Carol. much. Thank you, Carol. Thanks. Thank you for tuning into Lion Tree's 2024 Vision Podcast. We hope this discussion inspired you to find your own unique essence so that we can keep working towards building a world that can better serve us all. There will be more to come over the course of this year, but for now, thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed the discussion.